Okay. Well, thanks so much. Um, it's so wonderful to see everyone here, especially on a cold evening, um, and to be the last speaker of the year um, is pretty daunting as well. Uh, that whole range of uh, really kind notes of introduction, my most proud um, fact is that I'm a kid from the Osseo School District. Uh, I grew up here, I came back uh, for this role, um, and I know that things have changed quite a bit in our community over the years, and so it's a real pleasure to come back. And since I've been away, and m many of the roles that I've had have been uh, here while I've been in Minnesota have been global, I have been traveling quite a bit. So I'm in search of my tribe, and it's really great to be able to have time with you tonight. And I had time with folks in St. Paul earlier today, and um, so I look forward to the conversation we're going to have, because I think this is far more a conversation uh, than a presentation. So thank you for your time. Before we get uh, deeper into knowing me better and knowing this topic better, I think it's really important for us to get to know Dr. Glory. And so I'm going to uh, ask for your patience and attention as we watch this video about Dr. Glory. The hardest thing for me to see is the patient dying because of rheumatic heart disease, which is 100% preventable. Rheumatic heart disease is a disease that affects heart valves. Somebody can get rheumatic heart disease after getting strep throat infection. Here, most of the time in the villages, people have tendency to go to the local doctors, traditional doctors. These herbal medicines does not treat this strep infection. I see most of the patients come to me at a very terminal stage that I can't do anything. I want to help people. I want to be a doctor. I want to save lives. This program is really strengthening the health system of Tanzania because uh, we are reaching out to the villages to educate people about what is strep infection. So many lives you are saving by helping us creating awareness to prevent this disease. It's funding us to, to reach out to the community to give awareness to do the treatment. This is something great and uh, unforgettable. <laughs> yeah. So I shared that video for a couple of reasons, really not to talk too much about rheumatic heart disease, which obviously we're, that's the content of, of the video itself, but more to just suggest that while we're talking about global health, I think those images are very common to people who think about this topic. But when you really take a step back, we know that some of those hardships that people face are really uh, occurring a few zip codes away from us here. Um, when we talk about global health, we don't really necessarily mean not here. It's the globe, and we are a part of the globe. And so just thought it was really important to certainly start with what you would expect, a set of scenes that are really about other parts of the world, but really make sure that our minds are set on a conversation where it may not look like this, but it feels like this um, in a few zip codes away, and, and in this one as well. So with that, that's the, the perspective that Medtronic certainly brings in our foundation and how we think about uh, some of the inequities that are happening in healthcare, um, certainly from a philanthropic view as we continue to innovate even beyond that uh, from a perspective of the business. And so in talking about the topic, uh, you know, I'll be toggling back and forth between what's happening for us as a philanthropy and then, and then also what's happening for a set of conditions that are called uh, non-communicable diseases. My background's been in infectious diseases. I've grown up in the HIV movement and women's health. Um, I'll admit that when I joined Medtronic to lead this area, it uh, surprised me um, that there was something even called an NCD. Uh, what is an NCD? Why does it have to be clustered? Aren't there individual diseases? Uh, it was an awkward area. I didn't see where our movement could come into play. It was very uh, different from what I knew to be in traditional global health. Uh, and many of you know global health very well, and it's really based uh, on a structure. It's been built on a structure that's really there to serve children, moms, and infectious diseases, and emergencies, and food relief. Uh, and that's you know something that we can all be very comfortable in knowing. And those images that we just saw, even with Dr. Glory, were about we're commonly seeing them with that backdrop of disease states. 
But lo and behold, the biggest pressures that the globe is facing today is really in, inside of this category of diseases, which are uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, mental health, like the list goes on. But the things that are not transmittable, for the most part. And so when you see this, it's really quite shocking. And I'll admit for myself as a professional, I was uh, surprised. Um, and also just had to take a step back and say, my gosh, shame on me for thinking that somebody didn't die of a heart attack while we were trying to save them from HIV. Of course, they were, people are dying from a heart attack. But like most people and many pe uh, all around the world, we, there's a bit of malaise around this because we all have to die from something is kind of the concern when we think about uh, non-communicable diseases and especially what they represent. But it's gotten to a point now where the pressures that we're facing globally, economically, as well as just the, the pressures on the health system are so great that we can't help but respond. And so when you take a look at what's happening, um, certainly the numbers are huge. You can see what the death rates are. Uh, as we were putting this slide together, I'll admit I was a little bored by the slide on the right. I'm like, it's just a straight line. How could that mean anything? But if you take a really hard look at it, what is that about? It's about the low and middle income countries and what pressures they're facing and, what, uh, and how that's increasing over time. And so while it's a huge uh, pressure with the 67% that we're seeing in the pie chart, that rep represents all of us. I imagine many of you are either facing an NCD or taking care of one. I can double fist my hands on that. I do both. Uh, and we're represented there. But I'm not represented on the graph on the right. And that's the pressure that many of us who are traditionally inside of global health are working out. What do we do on the, with the, the looming um, and current pressure that, that these disease states have for us. And what's not in here, but should be, given what uh, Global Minnesota focuses on and all of your interest in, in foreign policy, is the amount of resources that are committed to this area. You would imagine, with all that we know about global health, that we'd have a lot of resources in the pipeline to work here. And actually, it's only 2% of the global commitment that goes to health that's really focused in this area. And what that means is it's not just State Department USAID resources in that. This includes uh, national governments and what they're spending. So when that's happening, we have a real issue in front of us. And that's what we're all trying to get our arms around. What, what can we do? Not only to resource something that we all need to be uh, and are currently facing ourselves, but also to think through what are some uh, glimmers of hope on what can be turned around. Because we can't treat our, ourselves out of this problem. We have to prevent things as well. Oops. So I'll come back to RHD because we started with it, and it's a worthy uh, disease state to just learn a little bit about. I'll admit I knew very little about this area until I came into uh, Medtronic. Um, without getting too technical, uh, it's, a, it's a disease that basically starts as an infectious disease, strep, and moves itself through to become uh, a longer term um, issue that uh, ends up weakening the heart valve. And in some cases, and there's some stats out there that say that 10% of maternal mortality in Africa is due to rheumatic heart disease. And why? Because women in childbirth strain the strain that that places on their heart. And that's when we usually f tend to detect it. Um, kids tend to get it, uh, of course, strep throat and uh, the inappropriate treatment and inavailability of penicillin and the appropriate kind of penicillin can um, accelerate uh, progress of the, of the disease. And uh, before you know it, uh, you have adults that are carrying the, the disease and kids that are dying early. Uh, it's basically the canary in the coal mine of uh, healthcare. Because if you were able to actually get strep treated, if you were able to actually get penicillin where it needs to be, um, this would be a very treatable issue. It's also a, an indication of how socioeconomic um, issues in health come to bear because of crowding. Um, and poverty, this particular condition is growing. And one would think that, again, this is something that's happening only in those situations where Dr. Glory is. And what I learned over the years that um, in a variety of events where we're learning more about this topic, the past prime minister of Australia is a survivor of RHD. Which is, when you think about it, um, there are many generations of people all over the world, and back to my first comment, two zip codes away, people are experiencing a challenging time with health care. So these kinds of issues are everywhere, and they're around us in ways that we can't even imagine until we start asking questions and seeing what's happening. From a Medtronic view, um, 
because it feels like one of the, the greatest social justice issues that was hiding that we couldn't, that no one's seeing, our younger employees are really actively engaged. There are all sorts of employee conversations around this area. There's research that's happening around uh, rheumat uh, rheumatoid um, arthritis and a variety of other conditions and um, trying to think through some discoveries that could be helpful. Um, in addition to that, just building a community around this condition. And again, with kids and heart disease, it's just an area of great importance to us. Oh, goodness, I keep doing the wrong thing. Um, so what we want to do is just go back to the socioeconomic impact um, and the social determinants of health. So again, RHD gives us a picture of that with what's happening with poverty, with the environmental conditions that many people face. But I think we've all been hearing a lot, especially in Minnesota, of all places about the issues that are economic that end up affecting our health. Uh, 80% of our health is due to things that are outside of healthcare, and yet we opine about what's happening within healthcare, and yet a lot of solutions are actually around it. Uh, we're seeing a lot more health uh, systems here, as well as insurers, start to take a closer look at, uh, at social determinants of health, uh, certainly greater amounts of funding going towards homelessness um, and a variety of other reasons, and we know why, because we know that healthcare costs go up if people aren't able to take care of themselves, and housing is a really important first step. Um, and that's just one of the many examples. And this goes well beyond uh, race alone or socioeconomic status alone. It really is around the social issues that need to be addressed and connection of services across social sector and healthcare. We also know that if we were able to focus on NCDs, we could actually save um, eight, uh, over 8 million lives, which is uh, quite a bit. Uh, when you think through the mix of conditions that are here. And uh, the date is really important here. It's 2030. And if uh, folks are here, I'm sure seasoned and know very well that we're all inside of the Sustainable Development Goals era. Um, the SDGs, as they're called, are part of uh, a set of goals and targets that the UN sets out in the hopes that we can all live in a better world. Uh, what that means, it's they're not just targets and issues around health, they're across all sorts of social issues, and every country, including this one, is committed to moving forward those targets. That differs from what the UN was doing a few years ago when it was really focused only on uh, the developing world. But there was a recognition that we all have to be in this together, um, and the things that are happening just around us require attention, and so we're all in a, uh, in a, in a set of uh, activities and progress and companies all around uh, the Twin Cities and the world even are starting to flag what kind of investments are they making towards different SDGs. Uh, and so things like um, setting forth targets that are about saving lives by 2030 become very important because 2030 is when the SDG targets are due. So we're all going to be called upon to report out how well did we do. And when you look at what's happening um, in global health and what's happening particularly with non-communicable diseases, it's pretty clear we've been here before. If you think back to the early 80s um, and throughout the history of global health, big crises that seem insurmountable um, that, are com that come together as if they are global emergencies, gather our attention and galvanize resources. And we've seen that in, uh, in each of these areas. HIV, we're still in it. Um, certainly family planning and reproductive health um, and women's health. And then disaster relief, as we all know from what's been happening anywhere from Puerto Rico to Indonesia to Kerala to uh, California. We respond quickly when there's something that, that seems to bring the world's attention. And yet with NCDs, it's been a bit challenging. But what we do know is when we do step in, and especially when we step in on the health system, it matters. So a quick story about Last Mile Health. Last Mile Health is a small nonprofit led by a very dynamic uh, young doctor named Raj Punjabi. He's actually won the TED Prize last year or two years ago. Um, he's a South Asian uh, immigrant, much like me, came over um, to start his career and family. Um, but he didn't come from uh, India, where I come from. He came from Liberia. He was a, a part, his parents had immigrated there, his family had immigrated there, and then during um, some political unrest, they came here, um, and here being the United States. He, out of his dedication, uh, said that he wanted to ensure that he took his talents back to Liberia and decided to build out a nonprofit that's uniquely focused on the last mile. So we know some of the easiest things we can do, even the hardest places, is to address healthcare closest to a facility, closest to um, areas where you have transportation. And the folks that tend to get missed out on are the ones that are further out, um, therefore the last mile. 
And so Raj took on taking, the, taking care of that segment of the population. And uh, like many others, his uh, organization received funding in family planning and HIV because, as I said before, that's where all the resources were. When we came to know of him and our uh, philanthropy, we thought, well, let's see if there's a way to integrate what ha happens in diabetes and in hypertension and uh, see if we can layer in our work uh, into his. Fast forward, and uh, we won't speak about Congo because it's really not directly tied to last mile health, but we certainly can think about Liberia and uh, Ebola and what happened two years ago. So all of a sudden, this nonprofit that's, in, that's small, in the middle of a very tough to reach area, is now called to action because of the Ebola outbreak. They responded quickly. Many of the health workers, and their focus is on health workers, uh, got involved to ensure that not only uh, that they were available to detect, but when it was possible to start to uh, get a sense of who was infected and not, and who was able to be treated and not, they were uh, engaged immediately. Not only that, they also were able to stabilize HIV treatments over time and family planning methods over time. They've been recognized because what the bottom line lesson is, as a health system, they were strong and ready. It wasn't about HIV, it wasn't about family planning, it wasn't about Ebola even in that moment. It, what, it, what it recognized, what we all recognized, was all of that investment actually strengthened the, the front line and the group of people we need to be able to be responsive as soon as people in need need care. And so that part of the story has actually elevated quite a bit in global health now to make sure that we're all responsive to what we know is a health worker shortage. So what we're seeing as we're coming through uh, the non-communicable disease um, age is that uh, we absolutely have to invest in the underserved. Those statistics we see are aggregated for all, um, and we know that there's a disproportionate pressure on those that are in great need. There's a huge global workforce shortage. Um, up to 18 million, um, we, have, we need 18 million more health professionals between now and 2030 to be able to make those targets. We're not going to get there. It can't work the way it works right now. Uh, and that means everyone from the cardiologist, if you needed to worry about uh, high-end services, all the way through to community health workers, which is basically where many people now are starting to put their attention. And again, Minnesota is really on the forefront in thinking about community health work and community uh, health workers. We also know that the web isn't just in connecting healthcare, it's in, uh, involved in connecting um, health with other so social services back to the social determinants of health and ensuring that if we take a patient view or person affected view, we're connecting in everything that they need. Again, that means we're looking at the system from a very different place. And then knowing that there, there isn't enough growth in the resources to ensure that things are sustainable if we go as we go today that there has to be a dramatic disruption in the way that we think about uh, financing this work. Which brings us to responsible philanthropy, which is what we try to do. And our aim being just a corporate foundation, we're not the Gates Foundation, we don't aspire to be, uh, but our job is to really, really catalyze other resources for others. You know, to take smart ideas, uh, grow them, and ensure that they're put together in sustainable ways so that the government, who is here to take care of those that fall through the cracks, is strengthened enough to pick up the, the ideas that are there and take them to scale. And so we've been working really hard to do that in a responsible way so that we do no harm when we start and we do no harm when we leave, um, but that we keep that cycle moving while we, entire, while we grow resources and grow those outcomes so that eventually we can get to improved health outcomes for all, which is very important because today of all days is the Global Universal Health Care Day. It's being recognized all around the world that it's important to focus on UHC, as they call it, uh, because we'll never get to meeting these demands unless we start to rethink the way uh, we, and the way we think about health, the way we deliver health and our beliefs around it. So back to a little more data, um, just more evidence on what's needed. We know that every dollar spent on NCDs brings back $7 in, uh, in return. We know that um, investing in the underserved is key, and this is a, a quick snapshot of some work that we're doing in Brazil, and one of the things that is a barrier is that when people make it to the clinic, the physicians and the nurses may not be there, or waiting time is very long. And so there was a lot of uh, dead time, and what folks realized that maybe they could try and start uh, some exercise classes and some ways of keeping people occupied during that time. And so this is just a photo of some women that are now exercising while they wait to, to get their diabetes meds. 
I don't know that that would work for me so much, but <laughs> I'd be on my device pretty fast if I could. But it's a great initiative. Um, we also have, um, we know this health worker shortage, which I mentioned before, and this is, this, these numbers keep growing, uh, depending on how you calculate them. And we know that here. When we see the growing number of young people who are interested in health care, the growing number of people who are underinsured or uninsured, the growing number of people who are unemployed or underemployed that are coming into our workforce, and the, the needs that we have in health care, and uh, the, the fact that we have a lot of community level health care that is delivered on a volunteer basis. So all of those gaps need to be addressed to be able to grow this segment. And, uh, and it's an important area to think through what job growth can look like in the lower parts of healthcare. And so when we think about that, um, Basharo is a young woman that is a community healthcare worker in Faribault. She represents uh, her community, which isn't only the Somali community, but certainly in Faribault we do have a refugee population that's growing. Um, she is, uh, and we'll learn a little bit more about her and that community in a bit, um, but she is uh, as engaged, as you can just see in the photo alone, she wants to grow and learn, and she wants to be able to continue to support her community in a productive way. She is uh, learning a lot about hypertension and diabetes and serving her population, and is also connected to a free clinic that now is receiving reimbursements um, because it's a part of the Mayo system. All of that is happening through a reverse way of thinking about referral and care, because of course the Mayo system wants to make sure that their, their catchment population stays healthy uh, as they're trying to realign and ensure that they're providing the right kind of care at the right time. So Bashar is an example of the variety of people that we could grow uh, the uh, healthcare market in if we were investing. We also know that depending on where you live, your ability to survive a sudden cardiac arrest fluctuates greatly by 500%. And we know SEAs are the great equalizer, right? Any one of us at any time uh, could come down with, a, with an SEA. Uh, so what we know is that there's a lot that needs to be done to ensure that people have access to care, that we're able to get people from point A to point B as quickly as possible, and when we're getting them there, it's the right place, and that they're not being taken to some place that can't take care of them. What we also know in reverse is that um, paramedics are more than drivers. They've got a, an immense amount of skill and also have an immense amount of trust in a lot of communities. We all let them into our homes when an emergency strikes and they know a good bit. So how can we use that part of the workforce to really deliver on health care? And so we're working very hard, not only around the United States, but in some key sites around the world to see what we can do to ensure this part of the health system also is ready uh, for NCDs, for those that are underserved. And then again, back to achieving universal health coverage. You know, we feel that all resources are important, um, and a view that really puts the community first is the first step for us to get there. And so we really want to make sure that that's happening. And the best uh, spokespeople for what's happening at community level are, again, the providers and community members themselves. And so this is Dr. Medella. He's from uh, South Africa. He is actually a part of a, of a project that we work on that's testing different models of how to get care to, the, uh, to the, the far re, uh, those that are far flung. And he's a physician who's really bringing back um, home visits from doctors, which is astounding to me because as a Minnesota kid, the last time I was really thinking about the doctor coming home was when I was reading Little House on the Prairie books. And I haven't had, had any exposure to that over the years, right? All of community health comes from a different time for us here. But this model is actually working again, and it's actually getting better results. And he's become a spokesperson by being able to get stronger in telling his story. And that actually helps when it's time to get people in WHO and uh, in government to pay attention to what's needed. And so we've had a great opportunity to have him in front of some members of Congress as well as people at the WHO. I won't go into any depth here. We come from a, a science company, so obviously we have a lot of data. Um, and we certainly believe, uh, as our um, as our CEO has really uh, prominently stated, that we should be known for the impact we generate, not for the dollars we give. So earlier on in the introduction, you heard about the $42 million that came out last year from us and the amounts of resources that Medtronic proudly and humbly gives. Uh, we're now really thinking through, um, does that matter as much as how much uh, impact we generated? And how can we flip this around? And so these are our first attempts at thinking about impact that came through uh, some of our philanthropic work. And without getting into depth, um, you know, a lot of people screened, a lot of people trying to get into care. Uh, knowing that it's very hard, so these numbers look bigger and better uh, when, of course, it's easier. And But when you choose the underserved, you choose for the hard. Uh, 
But one of the important numbers here is the over $2 million leveraged. What, again, as I said earlier, responsible philanthropy means catalyzing growth and bringing in other resources, and, our, and we work really hard to work with our partners to get there. And that number continues to grow. And the more we're able to do that, and the more we're able to partner with government um, to get there, the better chance at sustainable growth for those, uh, for those services. So with all of that um, time and investment over the last few years, what have we learned? And, and it's just in summation of what we've been talking about the last few minutes. Um, we know that you're, in order to improve health, you've got to get health and social issues connected together. Uh, but we also know that the demand is outpacing our ability to, to reach it. And we know that there's a shortage. Um, there's a lot that feels like it's daunting. Uh, but we think we can change this if we start to think about things in a, in a different way. And so we're starting to reposition and think through how do we really put the community health worker in the center of what we're doing. Because it's only through them that any of us is reached. We all know as people who suffer from a variety of illnesses, it's through someone else giving us a service or taking care of us that we get better. And so how do we get more of those someone else's um, stood up and ready? And so we hope uh, in time we'll be able to see some, some progress with that kind of focus as well. Um, and so we hope this is an example of what success looks like if I've got some help with the video because I'll mess it up. Um, thank you, Tom. Mm -hmm. Me trajo mi enfermedad, el diabetes, y hace tres años perdí mi vista. Cara, ahora no puedo manejar, pero sí me han visitado varias veces a mi casa. I worry a lot about my mom's health. She's the only person I have right now. If she is not on her medication or if she's not being taken care of, then I fear that I wouldn't have that much time with her. She needs these medications in order to be able to do her daily activities or to be at home. And to know that there's somebody else looking out for her, it means the world to me. What we can offer for resources is never the same thing, and it's never the same situation either. Life happens. You just don't know where you're going to end up at the end of the day. You could be assisting them with running to the food shelf to bring them home some food, filling out applications, reading letters for them, and helping them find some of the resources that they need. I thought it was important for us to start with Tanzania and end with Faribault, mm -hmm. right? It, and to really see that the problems that these folks are facing, we're not that far away from those problems ourselves. We all have a mom we're worrying about, a daughter that we hope isn't worrying about us. We are, are hoping we get what we need when we need it. And uh, with that, I have to pay homage to why we're all here, at least um, for those of us from Medtronic. Um, and certainly so many folks that are from the Twin Cities and those who have uh, deep connections in the med tech area. Um, as you may know, if you ha um, Earl Bakken passed away a few, a few months ago now, um, and he's the co-founder of our company. And without going into great depth, I've had the privilege of meeting him a few times um, and I'm proud to be part of what he would have considered his last dream, which is to make sure a woman leads. Um, and so I'm part of that dream and I take that very seriously. But in addition to that, he coined uh, a really important phrase that I didn't fully appreciate when I joined the company, which is this concept of extra life. Um, and I've really been putting some thought to that since he passed away and realized that it's more than the extra life you get from medical technology. Um, that's where he came to that um, idea from. In the sense of you see it very clearly with med tech. There's a before and an after and, and it's pretty clear that if it wasn't for the technology that you have, you would be gone. Uh, and so he, he inspired many by saying, what will you do now with this extra life? Uh, and what I've learned over the years um, in thinking about this is that, you know, I think all of us have an opportunity to think about our lives through an extra life lens. We've had tough times that we've come out of. We're helping someone who might be struggling with extra life. We ourselves may have, may, may not, doesn't have to be med tech. But we're here longer than we might have thought for whatever reason. And I think there's a really important translation of borrowed time into extra life. Because with that comes the spirit of giving back, giving voice, and, uh, and doing more. 
and with everything that seems very scientific and, and economic and all the things that we come into in the global space, it's really important to know that the individual contribution is what's most important. Um, and Earl and his work um, and all the work that we bring now um, as a part of his legacy is really to remind us of that. And you all have all of that power within you as well. And, and we hope that you'll help us with this NCD issue or whatever else you think is important in giving back to society. So with that, I, I think we can open it up to questions or anything else that you'd like to have a conversation about. Thank you. So, so while you give some thought to, to uh, possible questions here, uh, Barbie, could you just share, as you look around the globe, who, who are doing things right? What countries are, are getting it right on uh, achieving the healthcare goals that, that uh, we've been talking about? Well, they're, they're promising. Um kind of glimmers of hope. I wouldn't say right, because there really isn't a right or wrong, but I think there's, uh, there's promising things that are underway. Rwanda has always held up as a, as a country that has addressed um, things from an equitable view, put structures in that are allowing for, for scale in a lot of ways. Ethiopia is another country um, that has connected its success in turning some of its uh, health figures around because of community health workers in particular. Um, India is trying. Uh, they've just announced something that is, uh, I wish I knew the numbers as well. Um, <laughs> I'm trained in economics, I can't remember numbers. Um, but the, they have millions of health workers that they want to put uh, and unleash across the country. And in a country like India, that's a, that's a pretty big task. Um, so we're seeing glimmers there. We see a lot of hope in some of the ministers of health that are, that are online, uh, Kenya. There's a lot of progress there. South Africa, you know, they've, they've got what they call a triple epidemic with HIV, TB, um, and quadruple epidemic, and diabetes and hypertension. Um, and those diseases travel together, right? So it's really hard to get out of the loop. Um, and so they're really trying to face uh, that off well. Uh, Brazil has always done well because of its uh, firm belief in universalism and universal health care in particular. Um, like many countries uh, ourselves as well, it's going through its own political challenges and so we'll see how that plays out. But they've always led the way in, in doing things from a, from a universal health view. Um, it's a great question and I think the, the jury's still out because we've been so disease focused for so long. Um, that if you ask the question and we were talking about HIV, I'd say, oh, Thailand, Senegal, there's, uh, but in this moment, I, I think there's something to be said for not thinking about the disease and for thinking about the system. So the examples that I uh, was pulling forward are the ones that are really trying to do it from that lens. Sure. Um, having also worked for a lot of Yeah. Oh, can, yeah. Thanks. Can you introduce yourself too? Do you mind? Oh, yeah. My name is Doug McQueen. Uh, I used to be on the board of Global Minnesota. Oh, I'm a awesome. member. I also worked for General Mills for 25 years. Uh -huh. um, a big cooperation question. How do you go about prioritizing your resources against all these challenges when you're looking yeah. globally and the size of the, the challenge? As a, as a corporate person, you'll appreciate I was just working on a PowerPoint just on that before I got here. Um, we're trying to do our best to take a look at what um, what's important to the company, uh, because you can't you can't untether yourself from that, um, and where not only where there's need, but where there is enough of a system that you can hook into and start to see some progress, and where we think our voice could be most useful. So that RHD issue, for example, hits a lot of, hit a lot of those notes quickly because of the company we are, the issues that we focus on, the products that we have, and then the just deep disparity that that brings forward that just you know begs for someone to join into and it allows for another partner to come in because you need to have a, you need to have penicillin to make something happen there so we think through from a 360 view on what's best for the company where are our employees interested where can we make some um, progress in a short run uh, horizon where are governments interested because if we really are catalyzing you got to have something to catalyze um, and then what can we measure so back to what Omar says you know it's, a, it's such a, a wonderful book ending of, of impact through Omar's eyes and impact through Earl's eyes right they're the same but it's to start with that so where do we think we can actually um, make a dent on health outcomes um, in the most effective way. And we bring a lot of those ingredients in and you know, certainly analyze data first and then use that to choose our partners and our locations and then, and then move forward. 
Uh, we're in a very different place now than we were about four or five years ago. This issue, the, all of these issues were not being um, focused on to the extent that they are today. And, I, and we feel pretty strongly we had a hand in that. So um, it's getting easier. But we do break it down, cardiovascular disease and diabetes right now. So back to some focus, it's uh, just a couple of, of disease states right now. I'll let Tom do this. Um, yeah. I, I have a question about, um, does, is the WHO the kind of overseeing coordinating organization for companies like yours or Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? Mm -hmm. Because there has to be some coordinating um, something. Right, right. Because we're making great strides in cancer because they have one coordinating um, organization throughout all the researchers in the world, not just our country and other countries. Right, right. Is the WHO serving that purpose or is there another? Um, they're trying to serve that purpose. Um, and without getting into great depth, there's always complexity around the private sector and WHO, um, which is a great conversation to have and it's probably worth a, <laughs> worth a different discussion at some point in time. Um, but that complexity makes it difficult um, for them to serve in a, in a multi-sectoral um, coordination role. Um, what they are coordinating, of course, are member states, which is to say all the governments around the world and what and the ministries of health of that. And so, what I didn't mention during the RHD um, snapshot is that there, you know, we've been a part of this and it, we've been uh, lucky to be able to be a part of it. But there was an RHD resolution that WHO passed this year, and what that means in policy speak is just that it's a, it's a, it's a, an acknowledgement and a statement that uh, enables ministries of health all around the world to include the issue in their policies. And that's a critical first step if you want finances to flow and other things to move in that direction. So they do that kind of work, um, and they're best placed for that. Uh, but your question around where, who's coordinating all these resources, especially when you come outside the public sector, is a great one because there really isn't that kind of coordination. Um, when it was HIV, and I can speak from my own experience there, the Global Fund and uh, UNAIDS, and there were agencies that were created so that we could get that kind of coordination because it was viewed through the lens of an emergency. And the resources were, were rapidly increasing. Um, but uh, I would say for this issue, not as much. Uh, that said, of course, much like cancer, if you went disease state by disease state, there are plenty of places that researchers are coordinated uh, on, but again, the grouping of them all, not as, not as much, especially of the financers. There, there's an advocacy organization called NCD Alliance. Um, they, are, they do the best at uh, educating all of us on what's going on and advocating, um, but it's a great question. It's worthy of discussion, like I said, of the role of WHO and, and, uh, and the commercial sector and the private sector. Is the issue with rheumatic fever primarily education or distribution of the proper penicillin? It's distribution of the proper, well, I, I, th I don't think we can separate both, so let me take yeah. a step back. If it, it's education um, for primary prevention um, and then distribution of penicillin from, from there, the right penicillin in the right place. Uh, what I've learned, I'm, I'm learning about this area, um, but what I have learned is that the specific kind of penicillin that's needed is also the penicillin that's needed for syphilis. And in an era where women's health and STIs um, and reproductive health actually does get financed and there is a call to action around, there are some um, manufacturers that are trying to get engaged and involved in RHD under the, guy, under the rubric under of that. that. But on its own, it's not something that's taken on board. Um, in a, and it's fascinating, right? Like I said, I didn't know much about it until, until I came into this role. But I, I will say, when you look at the numbers, they're just as, um, as worrisome as the HIV numbers and, and others as well. No, it's heartbreaking to see these children yeah. die of heart disease because, because they weren't treated for strep. I know, and it's, a, it's the, the biggest dichotomy that, that's out there. And, uh, I don't think we'll ever have enough cardiac heart surgeons no. to, to deal with it. Not with that shortage that we Not just Not with that uh, shortage. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I always associate uh, the great, greatest amount of deaths in low-income countries to communicable diseases, and and there have been so many foundations working to eliminate, um, you know, the polio and all kinds of communicable diseases. Um, are many 
other nonprofits taking the same attitude you are that uh, that we should focus more resources on non-communicable diseases? Yeah, uh, they are. I think, um, <laughs> as you can imagine, they're seeing it, right? Because they, especially the ones that are truly rooted in community. Um, and are truly about giving voice to people who are affected and, and especially health workers, people, people don't show up in their disease states, right? They show up as the people that they are. And so that it's very challenging to have to turn people away because you're not funded to treat that disease, right? And so the issue that they're facing is uh, an, an interest to try and do more but not being resourced to be able to do that because uh, the communicable disease effort and the and the efforts that are around maternal and child health are very targeted to make sure that we make progress there which means it's hard to serve some of those other issues it's the it's the other side of trying to get focused and prioritize is how do you do that smartly so that you don't let too much fall through the cracks and uh, so that's what they're facing there's a lot of interest um, but uh, not enough resources I will say for and again I'm so biased for my my time in HIV but uh, for non-communicable diseases the first movers happen to be um, physicians and more clinically oriented um, players in healthcare versus um, I would say women's health or reproductive health or HIV, which flipped it in a different direction, partly in HIV, you can say, because we didn't have anything. Um, it was more community oriented. Um, and what we found in just those stats that I was quickly showing you is the ones that, were, that are more community oriented are getting better results uh, because they have the trust of, of the community and a lot of those workers know what to do because of all of those investments before. Hi, Hi. Um, my name is Erica. I'm a primary care physician and uh, a public health policy uh, master's student at the University of Minnesota. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more uh, what exactly Medtronic's role is when it engages with the communities um, and these, you know, healthcare systems. Um, is it more of um, I guess my question is, is it more like a research project where you try you know, to implement a certain program and see if you get better um, you know, outcomes? Um, how does that work? You know, how, you know, how do the programs that you're funding um, kind of serve you know, Medtronic's purpose? Like, is there like a give and take? Mm -hmm. uh, from uh, the work that you guys are doing. Yeah, um, I think it's important to note that um, Medtronic and many companies have a, a nonprofit entity that is their foundation. So just at the get-go, none of the work that we do um, is in service to the company. Uh, it is important for me to say that. There, it isn't a, a situation where, hey, we're trying to get more and more people in so that they, they can get more of our pacemakers. Um, that wouldn't be something a foundation would do. So if you take that off the table and you really do think about what we're doing for the underserved from a philanthropic view, um, the knowing that the resource pipeline is so thin and knowing that most decision makers need evidence to be able to make decisions about increasing that uh, resource pipeline in a company, in a government, wherever you are, right? Without the evidence, you really it's really hard to make a call. Uh, we structured our first phase around uh, demonstration projects that helped us understand what could work in underserved environments. So that's what you've been hearing the most about because that work is in play and it's it's soon to sunset. And, what, and that's why I was pointing to that leverage number so much, because it's through that evidence that, you, that others can now start to come in and provide their financing as well. So some of the principles of that stay, uh, but whether we're going to always have research attached or not is something that uh, is still under consideration now, going into the future, um, because there's a limited resources on our end as well and, and doing that can be expensive and so we're working through you know who are the best partners that already know um, and are ready to be active in growing those results and growing their own revenue through other sources in addition to ours so that we can help them get to scale uh, but the biggest thing is really honing in on the the health outcome and as a as a primary care physician you know how important that is individually and now going into policy you know how important that is in aggregate and if you don't get that right it's really hard to make a dent. So we're really hoping we can help people get there from that perspective. Um, I have a question here. Yeah. 
So one of the things I want to ask you is many NGOs and philanthropic and giving organizations, their capacity to give must be matched by a capacity to receive at the local mm -hmm. level. What are some of the common techniques you, you use to increase this local capacity mm -hmm. to receive? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, if, if, we kinda, if we go back into the global health field, um, like much of international development, it's really anchored on technical assistance uh, and building up capability of organizations because we uh, aren't there nor should we be. Um, and so we, uh, in this first phase, certainly uh, made sure that we were resourcing that arm uh, so that when we are working with uh, local nonprofit organizations that are really from community, because again, the success is coming through them, that they're also getting some skills building and, or, and institutional development as well through those, through those kinds of partners. Um, but along the way, you know, something that's really important to recognize is that a, a corporate philanthropy isn't just the dollars. Um, in order to get to the outcomes, it's also the, the high talent that we have in our employee base. And so if we were to think four years ago or five years ago, I don't think any, very many of us would be thinking about our employees and volunteerism as technical assistance in global health. But frankly speaking, they are, um, and they're the best. And, it, and what we get in return as a company is a set of employees who are giving back in a very meaningful way, who are using their skills in, ma in ways that really matter. Um, and, and as our workforce is changing, we're certainly meeting the needs of our millennial workforce as well as our, our more seasoned workforce um, that I'm also a part of, where you want to make sure you're giving back all these great skills that you have. And so it's been a unique time to be able to deploy our own talent as a way of building up those capabilities. But we're all learning um, in, that, in that avenue as well and, and want to make sure that we keep everyone inspired when they come home. Because once they're out there, they're, you get a very different kind of sense of what can be done. Uh, the last bit I'll add on that, we have, it's called, um, the program that we have is called Global Innovation Fellows. Um, they're cohorts of about five or six people that go out for three weeks and are working through basically a consulting problem with the nonprofit partner or the government partner in, um, in need. Uh, we purposely and intentionally uh, made sure that Minnesota was on the list of, of sites as well as Ireland, which is where we're headquartered, partly to help everyone realize that these are not issues that are far away and that a good idea may not always need to come from the U.S., uh, but the good idea could come from our employees that are from different parts of the world. And so we had employees from Russia and Colombia and Brazil and India come and see what they could do in Faribault. Um, as, a, as part of a solution. And that is uniquely a company. I mean, as we're talking about financing, it can come from anyone and a lot of foundations, but I think this is the part that really makes a, uh, being in a company really exciting. Hi, thank you for your presentation. My name is Carol Nelson, and I'm a physician at Hennepin County Medical Center and a volunteer with Rural Health Care Initiative in Sierra Leone. So I'm going to just make an observation and ask you to comment on it. Mm -hmm. The reason, part of the reason, not all, that there's a big increase in non-communicable diseases, the NCDs, is related to there's been a lot of improvement in communicable diseases. More people are surviving mm -hmm. malaria and other mm -hmm. various infections. So in some ways, this is a result of a su partial success in another area of global health. Mm -hmm. Now, so, and so as countries improve their economy, uh, they shift from um, having more communicable diseases causing mm -hmm. death to the non-communicable diseases, mm -hmm. and they are living longer. Mm -hmm. Their um, their longevity is improved. Just want, wanted to mention that and see what you would comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, and that often is the is a comment made, right? That's an often uh, reflection on the data. It certainly brings you there. Um, I think it, it's. Now, especially in the last couple of years, it's been such an important piece of evidence to bring us back to universal health care. Because um, in that moment in time, it doesn't matter whether you survive. I mean, it's, it's tragic that after all of this effort, you've survived HIV, but now you're passing away because of um, uncontrolled diabetes, right? But at the end of the day, it's because the system wasn't set up in order to give you the full suite of, of care that you need. And so uh, I think that exact dilemma is what's bringing people into the universal health care conversation today and is pushing a lot of donors, including the U.S. government, to think through are these, as they call them, vertical programs really the way to go now when you know that uh, people are being turned away for their, I'm making, up, making it up right now, but for their hypertension or diabetes needs because they, um, 
you know, they're, they're there really just for HIV. So a clinic might be set up only for HIV and would be turning away other patients that may have other diseases, which I find fascinating because when I started my career in HIV, it was the exact opposite. People were being t turned away because they uh, had HIV and didn't necessarily have a need for family planning. So it's a, it's a conundrum in global health, frankly, that this is what's happening. Um, and I think some of, like I said earlier, some of the malaise in this, in this particular topic is because we all have to die of something. And so that kind of realization makes it difficult to chase into this. We don't have a movement in this area. And the others do. So there's something about that which is, uh, which is compelling to think through. Um, and that's why the RHD thing becomes a little easier, right? Because we see the, we see the inequity in that and can jump on it. Um, but it's difficult to think about diabetes, hypertension, and some of the other things that any, any one of us could face as a movement. Uh, hi. Sorry. Those three, the three diseases you mentioned can be uh, seen as lifestyle diseases as mm -hmm. well. I mean, yes, there's a predisposition, but and then sometimes it's harder for people to get wrapped around the idea of helping people who need to help themselves. Mm -hmm. Do you think that impacts the? the I, th I think there's a, a definite point of view um, that's around that as well, and you, uh, some would say that even in the other disease uh, issues, um, it was the same. HIV being considered a lifestyle thing as well, right? So I think it's an, an issue of really, it's principle-based. Do you believe everyone deserves a certain level of care or not? And there's no judgment around that, but that is the fundamental question, right? Is there something about that that one believes? And if one does, then you organize things differently. If one doesn't, then it's organized in a very different way. And the, everything has a budget constraint. Everything has time constraint. Priorities need to be set. All of the business sides of this come in, uh, but the fundamentals remain remain the same. And so. Uh, the times I've been in those discussions and debates, it's been based on, well, what, what's your first set of beliefs, right? And, uh, and it moves from there. It definitely moves from there. I think that's why communicable diseases, in my personal view, uh, tend to catch a lot more attention because you could be affected, right? People get worried about the fact that things transmit. So, um, and when things are not transmittable, the panic and the concern is a different one. Um, and so, it, what brings us? What brings? Um, what brings us to our feet on things is it just depends on where you see the urgency. I think, that, and that's a very personal view. I think that's the case for everyone and how they think about their health. Um, hi, my name is Kelsey Kennedy. Thank you for your presentation. I work with United Health Group, and I want to go back to your point about 80%, I believe, um, of health mm -hmm. issues stem from some kind of social determinant yep. of health. And kind of like what you were just mentioning right now, um, I'm wondering what the dynamic is between the Medtronic Foundation and other kind of more social determinant of health, excuse me, um, related initiatives or programs or companies around the world. And I ask because I have a colleague of mine that's interested in tying um, climate change to oh. healthcare yeah. and trying to show that healthcare companies should have a stance on that because mm -hmm. it does impact health. Um, I'm wondering what the dynamic is like if you see that currently in, yeah. in your world. We see a lot, but what we're going to do is still a little tricky. Back to sharpening priorities and figuring out what makes best sense, right? So um, without getting into specifics around climate, but on some of the other more proximate social determinants like income uh, level, like housing, uh, like employability, you know, um, those are the kinds of things that in the first round come to mind because of who we are, right? We, uh, we, don't, uh, we have very little uh, direct-to-consumer contact the way a pharma company might. We work through providers for the most part and health systems and if that's the case then this shortage um, is very, very real. Whether you're in the business or in philanthropy, that number should, should be concerning all of us. And so what can you do for the underserved with that in mind? And so then when you start thinking about that, then it's clear that figuring out how to get more and more of the right kind of health workers lower in the system, uh, making a fair wage and being able to deliver care in the right way is, uh, is something on our mind. Now, I don't know that we'll do anything yet there, but as we think through different social determinants, that one comes up pretty quickly. In addition, 
addition to the variety of things that can come in around lifestyle things, like uh, what can we do about nutrition and what can we do about you know placement of food, uh, which we do have some studies and some things that we do. Um, you know, we certainly had one of our demonstration projects support North uh, North Market. Um, which is Pillsbury United's uh, effort in North Minneapolis. And what our uh, test was was to see if a wellness clinic inside of North Market, uh, uh, kind of fueled by uh, wellness coaches and community health workers, could actually help bring, um, you know, bring healthier uh, outcomes for uh, North Market consumers. And it did. So those are the kinds of things where and up to now we've been getting involved. On climate change, I think there's something to be said about uh, social responsibility and citizenship and what we do from a sustainability view and how a company with any footprint is trying to sort through that and, and where healthcare kind of comes in into play and that does come through in terms of what we do with packaging and, and getting things through our distribution channels. But, um, but I wouldn't know much more than that. It's great that people are thinking about it. It's uh, long overdue. We'll, we'll have time for uh, two more questions here and back. Hi, my name is Patty. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. I'm just sitting here thinking, um, you know, we sort of feel like in the West or in the U.S. that we've got a handle on communicable disease. Mm -hmm. So if something happens in another part of the world, we, we, we can do it, right? We know how to do it, but got the experience. But non-communicable diseases, chronic diseases, especially when you're talking about uncontrolled diabetes mm. and diabetes in general, it's like if you, in different parts of the world, I mean, there could be a flow of experience that comes from yep. you know, the villages and areas that you're working in in Africa back to the US Absolutely. because we don't have a handle on that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you know, there, right. there's a we you know, we don't yet have the experience or at least it's not as effective as we would like it to be, but maybe your work can bring some ideas back. Um, it's really know, beautifully can said. Flow this direction. Yeah, that's really, really beautifully said. We actually, um, you know, the, the one of the programs that we've been um, resourcing over the last couple of years uh, that had all these demonstration projects, uh, like the Pillsbury United example, like the Faribault work, um, was set up in nine different sites in, all around the world. And it um, and it's rare that you can set something up to be boundaryless, where there's free flowing information and learning. Uh, and, it, and frankly, only a private funder can do that more simply. Most of uh, public funding is for the U.S. or not. Uh, and so then it's hard to get that kind of cross-sharing. And so we took the opportunity to try. And so just uh, just uh, yesterday and today, uh, because we're closing the, that project out and gathering lessons, uh, all of the variety of people, nonprofits and health workers from around the world were here to do continue to do what they've been doing and sharing lessons. And so it's been really remarkable. Um, and there are awesome things that are happening in South Africa and India and Brazil that could definitely be brought here, and, and you're seeing that happen. But it really takes an intentional effort to focus on that and to push past the cultural divide and the, the language divide and the time difference and all the things that get in the way of trying to make that happen. Um, but it really is worthwhile when, when you can. Um, so it's a really good point. And there are, um, there are projects that are in, primarily in New York, I think, um, that have brought the community health worker model into, from Africa into the Bronx, for example, uh, to try and take what has been learned. Because community, community health and community health workforce um, is, is thriving in other parts of the world. Um, and there's uh, important pockets here in Minnesota, but it isn't something you see nationwide to the same extent. And so uh, there are folks that are trying to bring back ways of thinking to make to make that happen. So it's a great thought. Thank you. I guess I have the last question. Um, speaking of problems and issues nearby, is your foundation working at all with the Native American tent city on Franklin Avenue? Right. It's a great question. We aren't yet. Um, so it's uh, it's on our mind, and it's the, uh, one of the variety of things. You know, I, I sit on a roundtable of other CEOs of foundations in in the Twin Cities, um, and it's been coming up. And and not knowing all the details, as I mentioned, I traveled a lot. I'm just getting to know the Twin Cities again. Um, everything about the way that the situation is unfolding feels very much like a disaster. That's uh, a relief effort. Um, and so you know, certainly have had conversations just. Um, how does it get classified as such, and how do you unlock some resources when you do? So we haven't yet. 
Um, but uh, but we're certainly a part of conversations to see what uh, what is happening and what can be done. All yeah, right. Thank you. Well, this was great. Thanks. So